prior to Brother Mark's exhortation, he asked that we read from Genesis chapter 32, the first 23 verses. Genesis chapter 32, verses 1 to 23. This is when Jacob prepares to meet Esau. Genesis 32 reads, Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanim. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, This is what you are to say to my master Esau. Your servant, Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, men servants and maid servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the group who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought of Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. What you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. He spent the night there, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls and 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, Go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. He instructed the one in the lead, When my brother Esau meets you and asks, To whom do you belong and where are you going and who owns all these animals in front of you? Then you are to say, They belong to your servant Jacob. They are a gift sent to my lord Esau, and he is coming behind us. He also instructed the second, the third, and all the others who followed the herds. You are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. And be sure to say, your servant Jacob is coming behind us. For he thought, I will pacify him of these gifts I am sending on ahead. Later, when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him, but he himself spent the night in the camp. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. And with that, I'll now turn the podium over to Brother Mark, who has entitled his remarks, How to Give Good Gifts. Brother Mark. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Almost everyone. I guess we are missing quite a few, but there's still plenty of faces. Um, so here we are, almost at the end of our holiday season that uh, we recognize, particularly in this country, but around the world. Um, before you know it, the new year will be here, and then uh, it's kind of that long, slow grind through the cold winter months until spring finally comes. But uh, this has always been kind of a fun time for me as a child, 
you know, Christmas and the holidays, it's you get a break from school if you're in school. And that was always nice. <laughs> I learned that after I got a job and had to work through the holidays. But um, uh, there's just a festiveness, and everybody seems to be in a better mood during uh, the Christmas season. So it is fun. And of course, um, you know, one of the fun things, especially if you're a child, uh, about Christmas is that you get gifts and presents, and that makes it a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, to be honest with you, even adults enjoy getting presents, let's face it. <laughs> um, but all this uh, gift giving is now coming to an end. And, you know, really it all starts with Thanksgiving, if you stop and think about it. Thanksgiving is a time of giving thanks. Uh, not so much presents, but uh, being thankful. And um, it's interesting, uh, I didn't realize it, but if you read the, the original proclamation that Abraham Lincoln made, setting, establishing uh, the third Thursday in November as Thanksgiving, <laughs> I had to think about that for a second. Um, it's kind of a, it's not super long, but it's a, uh, it's about a four or five paragraph proclamation that he makes to um, set aside that day as a day of thanksgiving. And in that, that proclamation, he talks quite a bit actually about the fact that the nation was at war and there were a lot of bad things happening then, but that uh, he felt it was important. Actually, he was kind of encouraged by some people um, along this line that there be a day where everybody in the country stops and gives thanks to God for the blessings that the country had because the country was growing, it was expanding, um, they were mining um, iron to make things and they were clearing timber to expand uh, the civilized part of the country. And so there was a lot of good things happening, population was growing and all these things and he recognized the need to stop and give thanks to God for uh, all the blessings that he set in his proclamation says come, come down from heaven. And he mentions actually in that proclamation that in spite of God being angry at the nation for their sins, uh, he still is gracious and forgiving and remembers to bless uh, the people of America. And uh, that really struck me, I guess, because uh, I don't think any of our contemporary presidents would, uh, they kind of steer clear of talking about God because that's, I guess, the politically correct thing to do in the truest sense of being politically correct. Um, but back in Abraham Lincoln's day, uh, it was much more acceptable and widely known that the blessings that we enjoy uh, come from God. And so, um, you know, they set aside uh, Thanksgiving as a day to remember and thank God for those blessings. So we have Thanksgiving where we are to uh, give something, and that something is thanks. Um, followed immediately upon that, of course, in our contemporary society is a month of shopping and decorating and eating, all culminating, you know, on Christmas Day with the exchange of gifts. And for most of us here, there's also time spent uh, remembering the reason for the season, and that is Christ's birth. And that truly is the most important part of Christmas. And our brother Mike talked to us about that last week, if you'll remember, reading from Luke 2 about uh, Christ's birth. And um, so that really is the important part of the Christmas season that uh, most of the time, unfortunately, gets lost kind of in all the hustle and bustle of everything else that goes on uh, with the holidays. Um, and since Mike talked about that last week, I'm not going to talk too much about that part of it, but I do want to talk to the part about the part where we exchange gifts, and we, we have people that we give gifts to, and we have to spend some time thinking about what to give them, and um, for some people that seems to be a lot easier than for others. Um, but we all kind of participate in that activity, and that's a fun thing, but it also can be a meaningful and rewarding thing as well if, you know, we, we think about it enough. Uh, now, like most children when I was young, um, the fun part of the holiday obviously was the opening of the gifts. It was always fun to rip into a beautifully wrapped present to see what was inside. And if it turned out to be a pair of socks or a book, well, 
the fund didn't extend much beyond the uh, ripping paper part. Uh, but opening any gift is fun for kids. Um, how often do you see a child sitting there frowning as the present sits on their lap and they're about to tear into it? <laughs> Not very often. Um, so no matter what the gift is, uh, prior to opening it, it automatically brings a smile to a child's face. Uh, the frown comes once the paper's off the pair of socks. But before that, kids are pretty happy. Uh, now it turns out, really when you stop and think about it, most kids actually uh, like to give gifts as well as get them. Well, maybe not as well, but they do like giving gifts also. Um, a child will beam with joy as they present some carefully colored picture they've spent several minutes preparing. Uh, you know the sword, it could be a tree or is it an airplane? Oh, that's a portrait of me? <laughs> um, and so beautifully wrapped with equal parts tape and paper. Ah, the good old days. Um, and you, you, if you've ever seen a child give probably their mother <laughs> one of those uh, carefully wrapped uh, tape packages, uh, you know, the, the kid ca almost cannot contain themselves. They're so excited to see when their mom or whoever opens that gift because it's a fun experience for the kid to see the reaction of the parent when they, when they receive a gift because of all the anticipation of it. So um, as much as kids like getting gifts and opening presents, um, they also like giving them, too, when you stop and think about it. Um, I think perhaps children understood, understand, as Paul said, when he wrote, is more blessed to give than to receive. And interestingly, when Paul um, said those familiar words, it was in response to criticism he had received that while he was traveling, preaching, um, Many said he was freeloading off of those uh, he was visiting, that they were supporting him, all his food and everything was being provided by, by those he was uh, preaching to. But in fact, Paul says in Acts 20 that he hadn't received anything from any of the people that he stayed with. In fact, uh, he says in Acts 20 that he works extra hard uh, with his hands laboring not only to support himself, but also to provide for those traveling with him. You think of Barnabas and Silas and John Mark, that uh, not only was Paul not accepting gifts from those he was preaching to, he was working, in addition to the work of preaching, he was working uh, to support himself and his companions while they were preaching. And it was actually Jesus, he says, he was quoting, when he says, it's more blessed to give than rece to receive. Uh, we don't have a record of Jesus saying that, but we know if Paul said it that at some point it was known that Jesus had said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Um, it's just one of those things, many, many things uh, that Jesus said that isn't recorded in the Gospels. Uh, so while we all like giving, um, receiving gifts, we know sat the satisfaction that comes from giving to others is both more rewarding and longer lasting. Uh, as Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I suppose the uh, tradition of giving gifts this time of year could be linked to the wise men who come from the East and brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh uh, at the hearing of the birth of Jesus. In Matthew uh, 2.11, it says, And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures... They offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So these were very costly, very expensive gifts that uh, the wise men had brought. And it says, opening their treasures, there was no limit to what they were willing to give um, as a gift for the child Jesus that was born, knowing um, what had been prophesied about him. And so while our tradition of giving gifts during a uh, Christmas holiday may include gold at some point, um, maybe a necklace or an earring or a watch. Uh, I doubt much is exchanged in the way of frankincense or myrrh these days. Um, I've never gotten frankincense or myrrh, and I don't feel I've missed out. But who knows? Maybe I have. 
Uh, for me, the hardest part of gift giving is choosing the right gift to give. Uh, sometimes gifts are extravagant while others are thoughtful or practical. Um, the fun gifts to give are those which are unique and original and bring uh, surprise or excitement to the recipient when they open them. But those are sometimes the hard ones to think of. Um, the best gifts, though undervalued in our day and age, are gifts of our time, gifts of our love and friendship, and giving of ourselves. And those really, when you stop and think about the gifts that you've received over your lifetime, what you value the most are those things, the time, the love, the friendship, and just your friends or family or loved ones giving of themselves to you. And, you know, I thought a little bit, of, I thought a lot about this while I was uh, preparing this talk, and um, as an ecclesia, you know, we owe a great debt of added, uh, gratitude to our prior generation. Um, when I was a teenager, uh, my family had just moved to this area, and uh, I hadn't grown up in a Sunday school until my family moved to Chicago. I was 15. So I'd gone to Bible schools, and we did readings and things like that, but uh, we didn't live in an area where there was an ecclesia, so I never went to an actual Sunday school until my family moved to Chicago. And um, so I think back to those days, and it was Sister Mickey, actually, and also Sister Jen Zilmer, who were my Sunday school teachers <laughs> the whole time I was in high school. And it was uh, me and Dan, who's not here today, and Brett Hewitson, and Jennifer Zilmer, and um, Lisa Joyce, and uh, Lord Nisbet, and Melanie was in that Sunday school class probably, and Jimmy Larson, and a lot of my friends, and it was just, it was a great time, but I always think about Mickey and Jen, and the time they put into being Sunday school teachers, and, um, you know, in a lot of ways, it's those Sunday school teachers that shape who we become later as adults. And so that's a huge gift that was given to me without asking, and I didn't open it, but I do still cherish it. And the same can be said when you stop and think about it for our brothers who uh, speak to us. And over the years, I know I spent a lot of time as a teenager not paying as much attention probably as I should to the exhortations, but I can remember Herbert and um, Glenn and our brother Cease and a lot of the older brothers who would get up and speak and um, you know somehow some, a lot of it did sink in uh, even if I wasn't paying as much attention as I should have, but uh, these brothers have been a great influence on uh, the Ecclesia and the members of the Ecclesia, and those were gifts that they gave each Sunday uh, without anyone even asking and most of the time without anyone thanking them, but um, even though many of those brothers aren't with us uh, today, their legacy of the work that they put into giving that gift of their time and themselves uh, carry on to make this Ecclesia what it is today. So, um, those are the most precious gifts, I think, that, that we can offer. The, the time we spend with each other and the relationships that we build among ourselves, um, those are the things that they last so much longer than any present you could uh, tear a bow off and rip into. Um, now to our reading. Uh, so the reading in Genesis 32 there, uh, you'll recall that uh, many chapters earlier, um, Jacob kind of tricked his father into receiving the blessing of the birthright, and uh, uh, the, that birthright should have gone to Esau, being the, the oldest, uh, but Jacob was subtle, and he, um, he obtained the birthright. And uh, probably the last words that Esau said to Jacob in the 27th chapter was um, as soon as my father is gone, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> so, uh, 
So he was very unhappy about the trick that his brother played on him. And really the blessing then that Isaac gave to Esau was, you know, it wasn't a horrible blessing, but it certainly wasn't the blessing of the firstborn. And Esau knew that. And so he vowed to kill his brother Jacob when the time was appropriate. Well, so many years had passed, obviously, by the time we get to the 32nd chapter, uh, Jacob now had uh, wives and many children and great flocks and, and all these things, but um, he knew that, uh, you know, when somebody says they're going to kill you <laughs> and they obviously mean it, you, you don't take that lightly. So uh, in this chapter that uh, Brian was kind enough to read for us today, we, we see all the preparation that uh, goes into um, Jacob seeing Esau again for the first time after all those years, wondering if, in fact, uh, Esau was going to keep to his vow, or if somehow by giving him a really nice present, uh, Jacob could persuade his brother not to kill him. Uh, realizing, of course, that it was very much out of his own control. Um, and when you read there in, in the 32nd chapter, it was quite a gift, really, that um, uh, 200 she-goats, 20 he-goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milch camels with their colts, 40 kind, and 10 bulls and 20 she-asses and 10 foals. You know, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> Not something you can wrap and put a bow on, but uh, he keeps calling it a present. I don't, in the King James, repeatedly it refers to that as a present that he was giving. And um, so, you know, it was kind of a, Jacob knew he was at God's mercy in this situation, but at the same time, uh, giving a lavish gift to his angry brother um, was maybe a fail-safe of some sort, thinking maybe, well, if I can't appeal to his sense of what's right and wrong, maybe I'll appeal to his sense of greed, and it's always fun to get a gift. So uh, he makes this plan. They divide into the two companies, uh, because if Esau does decide with his 400 men to kill them, at least half of them would be spared. Um, so he, it was a very elaborate uh, plan that he came up with, and in the end, Really, you know, Esau was just glad to see his brother. And he didn't know what, the, what all this other stuff even meant. He goes, what, what is all the, this parade that you've run past me of all these people and these animals? Who are these people? And what's with all these animals? And um, um, so Jacob explained, well, that's my family. And all those animals are your gift for... <laughs> It's good to see you again, brother. Um, and Esau said, I, I don't want all that stuff. That's yours. You keep it. And uh, Jacob refuses. He says, no, no, that's yours. I want you to have it. And so Esau does keep all that stuff. Uh, but it wasn't the present that uh, spared Jacob's life. If anything, it was perhaps the prayer that Jacob makes to God uh, prior to that and uh, giving God thanks uh, for all the blessings that he had come into and praying that his brother would be merciful if uh, God could enact that, which clearly he did. So um, I guess there's a couple of lessons in there for us. One is if somebody's mad at you, it doesn't hurt to give them a gift. Um, but more importantly, the the prayer and realizing that we're all at God's mercy is um, going to be the deciding factor ultimately. So I, I thought, you know, of all the presents that we read about in Scripture, that's, uh, I don't know if there's a bigger physical, tangible present than that one that uh, Jacob gave to Esau. Uh, the Bible does talk quite a bit about uh, giving, and a lot of the giving that we read in Scripture has to do with, um, like, paying tithes, uh, giving to the church, giving to the needy, and those sorts of things. So, uh, those are important as well, and I want to I want to review some of those verses if you don't mind. In Matthew five, we read, uh, "Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you." In uh, Luke chapter three, Jesus. Uh, 
says, these are the words of Jesus, he answered them, whosoever has two tunics, um, has two tunics to share with him who has none, and whoever has food to do likewise. So Jesus encourages that if you have an abundance of things that you don't necessarily need, give to those who do need. Uh, that was the admonition that Jesus gave. In Hebrews we read, do not neglect uh, to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And that certainly uh, carries on uh, with what uh, Jesus had said. Second Corinthians, each one of us must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so um, we know, just as the Hebrews passage said now in Second Corinthians, that God wants us to give. He loves a person that gives cheerfully. And um, there's two things there, not to give reluctantly and not to give out of compulsion, that uh, you don't need to sit there and think about should I or shouldn't I, just do it. Just give it, and uh, but at the same token, uh, don't give because you feel forced to give. That you give because people have need, and because it pleases God, and that's reason enough. Uh, some um, warnings, I guess, perhaps in terms of giving. Jesus gives one in Matthew chapter six, uh, beginning at the first verse. He says, "Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them." For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. So that's pretty clear that you know, there was this tradition that as they sat in um, the synagogue and uh, they would come by and they'd throw in their uh, contribution. It would make a great deal of noise, especially if they were giving quite a bit. And people would think, wow, he really gave quite a bit. But of course, we know the story of the widow who threw in her two mites. And Jesus said, she has given more than all these other people have given because she's given all that she had. And that's the attitude that Jesus desires from us, that all these things that we have are not as meaningful as sometimes we cling so tightly to, but um, to give up everything and realizing what's truly important in life, uh, that's a person who, who knows how to give. Um, another warning comes in Proverbs, the 25th, and I, I'm sure I've read this verse before, but for some reason um, it struck me as I was preparing this that it almost was like something I hadn't heard before, but it makes so much sense. I can't believe I hadn't noted it before, but Proverbs 25 uh, looks like verse 14. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. And I you know, that's, uh, it takes some time to kind of absorb what that's saying, but, you know, if you're thinking about giving something and you can't decide if you should or you shouldn't, but you talk about it to other people and say, I'm thinking about giving so-and-so this, and then you never give it, you're like a cloud that has no rain. Um, you know, you're there, you're seen, everybody sees you, and but there's nothing that comes from it. And that's what it's like if you boast of giving a gift that you don't ever give. So uh, certainly a word of caution as we consider giving gifts to make sure we follow through on our intentions, particularly if we're gonna boast about it. Um, and uh, the last verse uh, is, it's sort of a warning, but uh, there's a real important lesson in it. It's in Ephesians chapter four, the 28th verse. And it's kind of an interesting thing that actually Brother Trent had pointed out to me one time um, that he and Sue had been doing their readings and they came across this verse and having read it many times before, uh, it really came alive to them at uh, this one point as they were discussing it and it, it really opened up a meaning to them and he explained it to me and I agreed with them as I usually do. 
Uh, but Ephesians 4.28 says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work for his own, uh, with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And I think the complexity of that verse is that here you have a person who's a thief and they're stealing. And so the admonition to that thief is stop stealing and get a job. And then when you get a job and you get paid, not only can you support yourself, but in fact you can support people who have need and might think of turning to a life of stealing. And so it's this, it's this whole thing where you realize to get out of a bad situation in life, um, do the right thing. And when you do the right thing, not only will you uh, become a better person and you'll be able to provide for yourself, but in fact, you can then, instead of stealing from other people, you can give to other people so that they don't turn to a life of stealing. And so it's, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's like 20 words there in that one sentence, but it says so much, it's, it's pretty amazing. And uh, scripture is often like that. So the Bible does has mu have much to say about giving. Uh, we've talked about the importance of giving, um, how to give that is anonymously and as is needed and without thinking too much about it, um, and also without respect of persons. And then also we've talked about how not to give, and that is uh, in terms of hoping others will see you, your generosity and think so much of you. Um, that's not the best way to give, but rather uh, to give as people need and nobody needs to know uh, your giving. Now, of course, uh, the greatest example of giving we find in Scripture uh, comes from the most familiar verse of them all. Uh, John 3.16, of course, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And when you think about all the gifts ever given, including the gift Jacob gave to Esau, which was a great gift, uh, doesn't compare to what God has given to us in giving us his son, Jesus. Um, we remember the miracle of his birth this time of year, but as miraculous and great as that event was, it was the life which followed that revealed the true value of giving. On the part of our Heavenly Father giving his son, showed his love for us and the extent he would go to in order to save us. On the part of our Lord Jesus giving himself to reconcile us to God and as an example of the type of self-sacrifice each of us are called on to demonstrate in our own lives. If we could find ways to pass that gift on to others around us, not only will we show a glimpse of that love which God has shown to us, but also in a small way we would, we would return the favor which our Lord Jesus has done for us through his sacrifice. In Matthew 25, the words of Jesus, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and fed thee, or thirsty and gave you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say unto you, as you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So brothers and sisters, like Jesus, we need to remember the tremendous gifts and blessings our Heavenly Father has given to us, especially the gift of his Son. When we reflect on what our Father and Jesus have done for us, we in turn then truly learn how to give. Thank you very much for your words this morning, Brother Mark. Prior to partaking of the memorial emblems, let us once again lift our voices through the use of a hymn, hymn 293 in the Praise the Lord hymn book. Hymn 293, which reads, When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, and you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, 
name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Hymn 293 in the Praise the Lord hymn book. your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So amid the comfort, big or small, do not be discouraged. God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done.
at the end, near the end of Mark's exhortation, he read what has been called the most precious verse, John 3, 16. Well, obviously, prior to Jesus' crucifixion, we see that he was falsely accused, tried, found guilty. But even before that, before he even set out to the Mount of Olives, Jesus left instructions for us. The very emblems that we are going to partake of shortly. And Jesus laid down the instructions on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Jesus replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. And Jesus answered that, Yes, it is you. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And our hope lies in this next verse. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. We obviously follow the example Jesus has passed down to us. Let us please remain seated while our brother Matthew gives us a prayer for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we take the time now to look at you and your Son, and the greatest gift that was given to us is your Son. His sacrifice is where our hope lies, and he has given his life so that we may live through his Son. We ask that you guide us and direct our minds every day, every week, until we can be with you in that kingdom one day, and we ask that you watch over us and be careful with how we live our own lives daily, and we ask that you send your son soon to be a part of his kingdom. And all these things we ask in his name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Again, following the master's example, we'll remain seated while our brother Russ leads us in a prayer for the couple. Loving Father, we, we come before you again and 